Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Uncast. As always, I'm your host, Jonathan Panazzo, and on today's episode, we're going to be talking a bit more about my servers, the new user profile component in Unraid 6.10, and what those things are for and how they differ. Uh, a few weeks ago, we started publishing the first release candidates of Unraid 6.10, and those were met with some confusion on behalf of the user base. There's this new thing in the top right corner of the web GUI now that we call the user profile component. And upon booting 6.10, you will see that it's asking you to sign up or sign in. And I want to take a few minutes to explain what this is all about. Now, I've talked ad nauseum in the past about my server, so I'm not going to rehash everything here today. But I do want to be clear on the purpose for this project. Users in our community range in their technical skill level. Some are incredibly sophisticated and others not so much. For those that have the know-how, setting up things like secure remote access, automatic backups, and advanced monitoring, it's pretty trivial. But if you don't, the amount of work required to get you there can be daunting, especially if it ever breaks and now you have to troubleshoot it yourself. It is for those users that we really wanted to provide a more comprehensive solution, which is why we began work on my servers. The entire point of my servers is to provide a set of online services that complement Unraid OS. Almost any objective that you wish to accomplish within Unraid can be done using containers, virtual machines, or plugins. But if you don't want to have to self-manage those solutions, my servers is a simpler way to accomplish normally complex things. Just a few quick examples of how this process differs for someone savvy versus someone that's not. To set up something like secure remote access, the first thing you ha would have to do is decide on a method. You could just simply forward ports on your router so that your web GUI is remotely accessible, but without SSL, your connection won't be secure and your system would be at risk, especially if no root password is set. Another method still would be to use a VPN, but that requires that any device you want to connect from must have the VPN client available to use and be configured. And yet another method would be to go back to doing port forwarding, but to enable SSL. The challenge with that is that by default, your web browser doesn't like it when an SSL connection doesn't have an accompanying certificate. It will throw up warnings and nag screens preventing you from connecting with a single click. Now you can try ignoring the warnings uh, or installing a self-signed certificate, but those nag screens will still slow you down. So you can try getting yourself a proper signed certificate then, but that means you also need to register a domain name, which comes at a cost, and you need to configure that domain to forward to your server's IP address. And then you have to get the certificate, which may or may not cost you, depending on the method that you choose to use. Whew. Seems like an awful lot of work, and the first step of just deciding on what method to use could take you quite a while to decide if you're not in the know. And that's the important part here. You know, I know we, we have a lot of savvy users in our community that have a very deep understanding about how to do these things. But if you don't, just getting started can become an hours long project. You have to do a ton of online research to figure out like who can I trust to give me the right instructions to guide me to get this set up in a way that isn't gonna leave me screwed over later on. Um, so that's, that's the big difference I think between being a savvy person that knows or at least knows enough to know what they're looking for and someone that's not who really wants to, to have their hand held throughout the entire experience. So with my servers, the only piece that you're ultimately responsible for yourself is setting up the port forwarding on your router. We take care of the domain name and the certificate automatically. Within a few button presses in the UI, you can have a fully functional remote access solution up and running with a proper SSL certificate. The net difference in the amount of time it takes to accomplish this fairly basic need is incredibly substantial. So again, the entire point of my servers is to make it so some of these cool things that other savvy users have been doing for years can be quickly accomplished by the less savvy through our solution. And we're not stopping there. There's quite a healthy backlog of features we intend to roll out on my servers over time. More about those in another podcast. Okay, so now let's take a little bit of time to talk more about the user profile component, a new element that everyone will start seeing in Unraid 6.10. The UPC is nothing more than a way for you to log in using your Unraid.net credentials as a way to simplify registration key management. Let's dig a little deeper to explain. So over the years, we've continuously tried to make the process of getting a key to test out the software as simple as possible. It started by requiring users to provide an email address, then we would email them a trial key. 
Then the user would copy the link to that key from their email and paste it into the install key field on the tools registration page and then click install. Later we realized this was a lot of extra work on behalf of the user to do something that we could do entirely through the web GUI without requiring the user to ever go to their email. We just download the trial key right to the system, which definitely makes things easier. But this still made the process of purchasing, upgrading, and re-downloading keys somewhat of a pain. You'd have to remember to go to that tools registration page in order to buy, and then once purchased, you were then relegated to having to go through the same legacy process for installing trial keys. You, know, you have to purchase, then you get an email with the link, and then you paste that link into the install key field. But we definitely couldn't uh, automatically just send the key down to the machine based on the flash GUID because what if someone was able to spoof your GUID on their machine and now they have a copy of your key which they could then use to generate a replacement simultaneously blacklisting your old flash. That's why this process remained largely unchanged over the years, but it still comes with its own set of issues. For example, what do you do when your flash dies and you can't find the email with your registration key? Well, you're just dead in the water until you manually message us and we manually reply. That user experience has been gnawing at us uh, for some time, and because we know it's not ideal. Uh, as such, we decided that it would be a lot better for users to have accounts with us when they purchase, so in the event they ever need to recover that purchase, they can do it directly through our website just by signing in. You know, like basically every other online ordering site has been doing for quite a while. And this is how the UPC in version 6.10 was born. Now, the part that confused some people was that in 6.9 and earlier, the UPC just doesn't exist. And if you installed the My Servers plugin, it would add the UPC to the interface as part of that plugin. In version 6.10, the UPC is always present, but it does not include all of the My Servers functionality. That is still a plugin even in version 6.10, though we've made the process for installing it as simple as a drop down item from within the UPC itself. So to be perfectly clear here, in 6.10, everyone will have the UPC available to them, but no one will be forced to utilizing my servers or any of its features should you not want to. In addition, as of version 6.10, users will first create or log in with an Unraid.net account in order to obtain their key. Upon sign-in, if the GUID in use has never been registered before, meaning the flash drive, a trial key will be downloaded to the system automatically. If the GUID has been registered before and that registration matches the user that signed in, it'll be downloaded automatically. Key. And in addition, if you ever need to download your registration key again, you will be able to do so from the My Servers page on forums.unraid.net. Now, some users have expressed a concern about signing in with an online account on their local server. Our promise to you is that when the UPC is signed in, no information is sent nor is an active connection maintained to our cloud infrastructure. The only thing that is different from 6.9 in this regard is that once signed into the UPC, if you navigate to the My Servers page on forums.unraid.net, you will see the ability to manually download your registration key directly from that page for either trial or paid keys. In addition, if you do not want to remain signed in on your local server, you can sign out after your key has been installed. This functionality is specifically there for people that just plain don't trust us when we say there's no active cloud connection maintained. We realize that trust is something you earn, not something that is just given automatically. So much thought and care was put into making the decision to let users sign out. Just know that if you ever want to recover, replace, or upgrade your key later, you will first have to sign in again to perform those actions. But once you're done, you can sign out again if you so choose. Okay, so all of that being said, I do want to address one more topic regarding existing registration key owners. Some people in the community have a fear that because of the UPC and my servers that we are working our way toward ending the ability for existing registration key owners to get updates for the OS. Hear me loud and clear today, please. This is not the case. We will always remain true and loyal to our customer base and never pull the rug out from under our users. We've been operating since 2005, and folks that purchased keys back then are still receiving updates for the OS even today, and that benefit will continue for existing key holders. And I want to take a moment to personally thank all of you key holders out there. You know, I joined Lime Tech back in 2014 when Tom just started working on version 6 and the move to 64-bit. I had a healthy career previously in the IT industry. I had a ton of clients, a solid book of business. I gave all of that up 
to join Tom on this journey. And I even brought my longtime friend and developer, Eric Schultz, with me. I literally bet it all on Lime Tech, putting my livelihood at risk to see if we could take this thing to new heights, new heights, new heights. And boy, am I glad that I did. Because of people like you who have purchased Unraid, told your friends about it, spoke about it on social media, etc. I now have a career working at a company I love with talented and amazing colleagues and a vibrant and engaged community. So from the, from the very bottom of my heart, thank you all for your continued support. All right. So I think I've done a pretty decent job of covering the key changes in 610, the UPC versus my servers, and our commitment to customers. So let's move on. The next thing that I want to talk about on today's episode is ZFS on Unraid. So for those that have been paying attention, we have a community poll going right now uh, to ask what feature is of most interest for implementation in 611. As of today, that poll is showing overwhelming support for ZFS. As such, I thought I'd take a minute to go over why ZFS will be such a key feature for the OS. So first and foremost, ZFS is a proven file system. Its development began back in 2001 at Sun Microsystems, and it grew over time. In 2006, it began getting ported over to Linux, and it was finally marked uh, stable in 2013. That means that, that as a stable file system, ZFS has been around for eight years, but it's been developed for about 20. And from a feature standpoint, it is very similar to the currently supported ButterFS that we have in Unraid for our cache pool. Both ZFS and ButterFS tout features such as pooled storage, copy on write, and snapshots. However, there are two very critical difference, differences between these two file systems. For ZFS, the primary downside is when it comes to an expand when it comes to expanding an existing storage pool. With ButterFS, you can add disks one at a time, regardless of what type of pool you create. ButterFS accepts the new devices, rebalances the data on the existing pool to include those devices, and all of that can be done in real time while the pool is running. ZFS, however, doesn't yet offer a way to add disks one at a time to an existing zpool. To expand capacity on an existing zpool, you would have to replace each disk in the pool one by one with larger sized disks, and once all of the disks in the zpool are replaced, the entire pool can be expanded to utilize the increased capacity on the new disks. Unfortunately, this means you can't continue utilizing the old disks as part of that pool. You are replacing them, not adding to them. Now, you could then create a new zpool with your old devices, and now you have two pools operating, but that means that each pool will have its own limits to capacity. So you can probably see why we started by implementing ButterFS. The, the entire process of creating a pool and adding disks to the pool for ButterFS works the exact same way as it does for the array in Unraid. So it was just very logical for us to, to go with that because one of the biggest benefits, I think, to, to the platform that we have is the ability to expand and is the ability to use devices of different types and, and sizes and protocols. Um, so so that's, a, that's a big element here to consider. When it comes to ButterFS, the primary downside is the lack of stability in RAID 5 and 6 support. ButterFS works great for single devices or RAID 0, 1, 10. Uh, but RAID 5 and 6 support is still plagued by an issue known as the write hole problem. This issue is significant enough that the developers themselves of ButterFS have an entire page dedicated to calling this out and that it's not production ready for that use case. The main issue is that if an unexpected shutdown were to occur due to a power failure or a kernel lockup, this could result in a partial write that provides inconsistent parity data. This problem is complex enough that even though an RFC patch was posted to fix this back in August of 2017, it has not been implemented yet. And there are other issues noted on the ButterFS wiki which indicate this problem has multiple facets that need to be resolved. Now for Unraid, we heavily push users to leverage ButterFS RAID 1, which is not subject to this write hole issue. And ButterFS RAID 1 has proven to be very solid and stable for the vast majority of our user base that is using it for caching rights to user shares over SMB or NFS, uh, storing applications and their data for plugins and Docker containers, and even storing vDisks for virtual machines. What ButterFS RAID 5.6 would give us is a performance-centric solution for storage that doesn't require as much of a sacrifice when it comes to capacity. Remember, RAID 1 means you're giving up essentially half of your raw data capacity for redundancy, whereas RAID 5 or 6 is far, far less. Now, what's interesting is that over at ZFS, they are actively working on a project to add the ability to grow existing Z pools one disk at a time. How long until that code is considered stable? Who knows? But the point is that they are trying to add this to ZFS as a way to put them at feature parity with ButterFS when it comes to ease of expansion. 
And of course, at ButterFS, they are continuing to work on the RAID 5.6 problem to put them on feature parity with ZFS as far as providing a solid and stable high performance and high capacity solution. So you're probably thinking, okay, thanks for all that, but I still don't really understand why Unraid needs ZFS support. So the simplest way to put it is that adding ZFS to Unraid would provide a high performance and high capacity solution for storage that we are lacking today. For people building a media server for a small number of users, this probably doesn't matter so much. But if you're looking to use Unraid for a larger quantity of concurrent users or generally higher performance needs like video editing over a 10 gig network, neither the Unraid array nor ButterFS adequately addresses these needs. By adding proper ZFS support, these use cases become not only possible, but ideal, and expand even greater use cases that I'm sure our friends over at Linus Tech Tips would be excited to showcase. It is for these reasons and more that make this feature oh so compelling to implement, and we hope to do so very soon. Before we go, I do want to highlight that in an upcoming episode, I will be having Tom Mortensen, our founder and CEO, on the podcast to talk more about the history of Unraid, even predating Eric and I. Uh, if you guys out there have any questions for Tom that you'd like me to ask him on the show, head over to the forums and send me a PM with your questions. If you don't know it already, my username there is John P, J-O-N-P. Okay, well, that wraps it up for today. I know this was a bit of a shorter episode than previous ones, but that's okay. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you guys on the next one.